Service will begin in 15 minutes. Thanks for joining us.
service will begin in 10 minutes. Thanks for joining us.
service will begin in five minutes. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.
service is about to begin. Good morning, everyone. My name's TJ, and this is my wife, Caitlin, and we are excited to welcome you to the church service of the central region of the Boston Church of Christ. In Isaiah chapter 19, verse 19, it says, In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt, and a monument to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender, and he will rescue them. And what's so amazing about this verse is that it's talking about a people that for the majority of their history had just rejected God and refused to turn to him. And yet it talks about there, that there will be a time when they recognize that with all of the crazy things going on, God is the only one that they can turn to. And really it's, it's, it shows God's heart has always been for people to turn to him in the midst of challenges and oppressions, whether it's your first time worshiping with him this morning or uh, your thousandth, God wants you to be able to turn to him and build a relationship with him. Yeah, and just like how people back then were crying out for help from their oppression, our situation today hasn't changed. I mean, you don't have to look very long or scroll down your timeline for very long before you see that people are still crying out for help, for guidance and deliverance. And unlike most people, we cry out to a personal God who cares enough to do something about it. We know how God brings his salvation through Jesus at the cross. He paid the debt we should have paid and he died the death that we should die so that we could take his place with our father in heaven. Today, we've heard many people talking lately about how they're going to fix all of our problems and save us from our situations, but people can only do so much. And it brings me so much comfort to know that God's salvation and his saving grace didn't stop at the cross. He's still doing things now as we call out to him. And that's the kind of God that we're here to, to serve and to worship this morning. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer as we get ready to continue with our church service. Father, thank you that you care so much for us that no matter where we are, how we've turned away from you or hurt you or rejected you, uh, we can form a relationship with you. I just pray that you help us to hear you speaking to us this morning and that we can really grow in our intimacy with you. We love you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me. How great is our God, and all will see. How great, how great is our God. Lion 
hands with power and wisdom. Our God is an awesome, and we know that He's awesome. And He reigns with power and wisdom. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Yes, we know that He's awesome. And He reigns with power and wisdom. Our God is an awesome, and we know that He's awesome. And He reigns with power and wisdom. Yeah, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Central Region, the Boston Church of Christ. It is great to have you with us on a Sunday morning. Brothers and sisters, always a pleasure to be with you, to worship together. I wish you were here in this auditorium, but someday we'll be together again. Uh, if you are visiting with us from the men's day on Saturday, welcome back. I hope that uh, this worship service will be encouraging to you. I have a sermon on my heart this morning that I would love to preach. It's entitled, Three Things That Make You Better. Now, let me just say right off the bat that this is not a self-help message. I am not a self-help guru or have all of these, you know, corporate principles and strategies to make yourself better. Uh, this is a sermon for the soul. You know, in Hebrew thought, the soul is our responsibility. It's the most enduring part of you. Jesus once said, what good is it for man to gain the whole world and yet lose his very soul? So I'm going to talk about three things that I believe will better our soul. And the first point I want to leave with you is this. Always look to the sky. Stay with me on this one. You know, there's an old Jewish story where a rabbi is looking out of a window where a man named Heichel is running up and down the street looking worried, busy, and burdened. So the rabbi shouts out of the window, Heichel, come up here. And Heichel stops. He sort of looks up at the window where the rabbi is standing, and he walks around the house, and he proceeds to climb up the steps towards the rabbi. When he arrives in the upper floor, the rabbi puts his hand around him and he gently walks him to the window and he says to him, Heichel, look out there, what do you see? Heichel says, I see women, men, donkeys, hurrying and carrying their burdens. And then the rabbi says, Heichel, what you see today will be the same 50 years from now. What is will be again. But what value is all of it if you don't have time to look at the sky? I love that story. Have you been out of the house lately in this busy and burdened world to look at the sky? You know, uh, for some of us, we have heard this psalm before, uh, those of us who are in the church. Psalm 121 has become one of my favorite psalms, especially in this time that we're in. I just want to read it to you again. In Psalm 121, the writer says, Lift up your eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. 
The Lord watches over you. The Lord is the shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. What a beautiful psalm. You know, we, 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 we see the writer, he's saying that, you know what, where does my help come from? I look to the sky and there I find the presence and the power of God. Jesus, in John chapter 17, verse 1, after he speaks to his disciples, it, he says he does something interesting. It says, he sees, speaking to his disciples and he says, I've told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. After Jesus said this, he looked up towards the heavens. Jesus looked to the sky. And his prayer goes on. He prayed for us as a church. He prayed for unity. And he prayed for those who are yet to know God. You know, today when we look to the sky, we find a throne of grace. Remember that? My very first sermon. I just want to remind you this morning that we find a throne of grace to help us in our time of need. That's what Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 said. Now, if you're thinking today and you're checking in with us for the first time and you are, you're kind of curious about exploring a relationship with God, you know, you can look to the sky. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, it says, For the Lord searches every heart, and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he, you, will, he, you will be found by him. You know, I could so remember about three decades ago, so I'm dating myself, when I became a Christian. I was a college student at the time, and um, I was standing on my balcony of my apartment floor. It was the 23rd floor, and I remember... I was so tired of the, the busyness of my life. And, you know, it wasn't like I was busy doing good things. I was actually busy doing a lot of mischievous and bad things. And I just felt empty inside. I felt like the things that I was doing was just not satisfying my soul. So I stood on the balcony. I remember looking up to the sky. And I didn't know, really know how to pray. So this is what I said. I said, God, if you are out there... Show me where to begin. Amen. And that was it. And I went back into my house. 48 hours later, someone knocked my door and invited me to a Bible study. It blew my mind. I think God heard my heart. God was looking at my heart. He knew my desires. As I came before him, and I just asked him to find, if, if I could just find him, do you know that God wants to do the same for your life? That if you seek him, you'll find him. You know, I want to introduce you to a new brother who was actually baptized, or oh, about a, a week and a half ago, Paul Recuprio. Paul is actually a tax accountant by profession. And Paul is a very close friend of Ed Simone. And they have known each other for about 25 years. And I've had the privilege of being in the last few Bible studies with Paul. And there was a moment when, you know, we were at the point when I asked Paul, I said, Paul, why do you want to become a Christian? And Paul said, you know, I've been doing a lot of things in my life. And it, I, I find I just come up empty. And I just want to become a Christian because I want a relationship with God. I've never wanted this, anything more in my life. That's when I knew that he was ready. You know, it's really important that if you are going to get better in your soul, take time to look to the sky. There you will find a God who will help you in your time of need. My second thought is this, to believe is more important than being perfect. You know, I heard a testimony from another evangelist uh, who 
uh, who, was, who mentioned he had gotten a, a phone call from his 93-year-old father who raised him to have faith in God. And uh, his dad called him up one day and he wanted him to come over to his house very quickly. So uh, he was very concerned. He got dressed and, you know, he got over there as, as soon as he, he, he could. By the time he got there, uh, his dad was sitting in his favorite chair and, you know, the son begins to walk over to him and he's got this lump in his throat because he was 93 years old, he had been through several surgeries and he was now battling cancer. So he slowly walks to his dad and his dad calls him over and he says, take a seat. And, he, you know, he takes a seat next to his dad. His dad leans over to him and he says, come closer, son, I want to tell you something. And then dad says, son, I was thinking of starting a transportation company. Did you get that? You know, he wasn't perfect, but he had this faith where he believed that he could still do something with his life. You don't have to be perfect to believe. You know, there's a really cool passage here in the Gospels in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. This is where Simon has gone out to fish all night. And he has this encounter with Jesus. I'll read it to you. It says, One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesareth with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then they sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Simon, put out into deep water. Let down the nets for a catch. Simon, asked, Mas Simon answered, excuse me, Master, we have worked hard all night and we, we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll let down my nets. When they, had, when, he, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners from the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the son of Zebedee, and Simon's brother. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled up their boats from on the shore, left everything, and followed him. You know, this is, a, this is just a great account. Simon is having one of those I am not so good moments. He ever had one of those feeling bad about himself? This mistake that he has made. He underestimated the Messiah. And he was kind of beating up on himself. And he says, God, just, just, just go away. I'm not even worthy. I'm not perfect. Why do you want to be around me? Have you ever had one of those moments where you feel like, God, why do you even believe in me so much? Why do, you, why do you love me so much? You know, there's some of us, we can really beat up on ourselves like that. And the next question I would have for you is that even in your state right now, right now, wherever you are, maybe you're having a good, you know, a good week, maybe you've had a bad week, maybe you had a slow start to the year, do you believe that God can still work in your life and through your life right now? Now, you might be saying, you know, I, Richard, I, I, I'm too young. I just became a Christian. I don't even know much about my faith. I'm kind of learning. Maybe that's one of your, your challenges. Or, or you're feeling like maybe I'm just too busy. God can't use me. And I always say to people who are so busy, so just go on the strength that you have. Just do what you can. God can do the rest. Or maybe you feel like you have too many problems going on in your life and does God want to use me with all these problems in my life? Go away from me, Lord. I, I'm just not ready. I'm not perfect. You know, I know for me personally, um, I love being ready for the new year. 
I love having my I's dotted and my T's crossed. My goal's all set, you know, and okay, I'm ready, I got my plans, but you know, this year has, uh, has been really interesting. Uh, with all of the COVID and all the things that's happened lately, you know, I just felt like I was kind of stumbling into the year. And let me give you an example. I'm in school right now, and uh, you know, uh, I have a class on a Tuesday, and, and of course it goes from week to week, and so every Tuesday you got to do the readings and, and, and have a paper to write, and then you have to present. And you're presenting, of course, this is online, and the students are, you know, are checking in, and so you, everyone has to present what they have learned. And uh, so about two weeks ago, I was so excited, I got all my work done, you know, I got, I got my assignment in on time, and so fast forward now, it's my turn to present. So I'm ready to present. And uh, the professor says, go ahead, Richard. And I, I, I am starting to wax eloquently my thoughts about the subject. And everyone's looking at me, and they have these blank stares, and I'm thinking, they must be just uh, amazed by what I'm saying. And then it was all said and done, the professor patiently says, that was good, Richard, but uh, you actually did the wrong assignment. That's how my year began. I, I felt so embarrassed. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. But you know what? He said, listen, man, it's, it's been a rough year for everybody. You know, hey, you, you got a do-over. Don't worry about it. Just go on and, and, and get it done, and, and, and you can hand it in later. Jesus is talking to Simon here. And he says, Simon, Simon, get up. Don't, don't worry about it. You know, my grace is sufficient for you. From now on, you will catch men. You see, you don't have to be perfect to believe. You don't have to get rid of all your problems to believe. God can use you exactly where you're at, anytime, anywhere. I must, I must say that in my 30-something years of my Christian life, I have met people who have become Christians sometimes on the worst days of my life. I just had to open my mouth and God used it. You know, God used, you know, my evangelism. And in general, you know, the lesson is, Richard, it's not so much about you. It's about my power working through your weakness. And so when someone asked me today, well, how, you know, how are you starting your year? I think it's still early enough, you know, for someone to ask that question. I said, well, I'm not exactly ready. I'm ramping up, but God is ready. God is always ready. And when he calls you into his kingdom, it's not a mistake. His grace is sufficient for you. And then my final point is this. Cultivate joy in your life. Now, I want to say that operative word here, cultivate. I think about cultivate, I think about working on something. For some of us, we are just naturally joyful. You come into a room and you just bring a sense of, I guess, positivity, if you will. But, um, you know, I, I wanted to say that, you know, when you hear this point, you, you know, you might be sitting next to your spouse or your roommate and they may not be the most joyful person on the planet. But here's what. Don't elbow them. Don't, don't look at them out of the corner of your eye. I want you to listen to this, okay? Cultivate joy in your life. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, this is what Jesus is saying. Of course, he sends his, uh, his men out to preach the gospel. And then they're coming on back. And the demons are submitting to the message of Christ, and these guys are just on fire. And this is what Jesus says. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to 
the little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. I love that. Jesus, full of joy. I would love to have been there to hang out with Jesus. I think Jesus was a man full of joy. He had a lot of weight on his shoulders. But you can sense here that he was so full of joy. And so were his men. But he says, listen, guys, don't stake it on what you just did. Let your joy come from above. Remember, look to the sky, that your name is written in the book of life. I look at that and I'm reminded that joy is not a destination that you arrive at when everything works out. So everything has to fall in place for you to be happy, for you to be grateful. You know what? You, you, you never get there. I think joy is a spiritual energy that we bring to life because our names are written in heaven. Let me give you an illustration. Here's another one. You know, a family had a goldfish that uh, they really delighted in. His name was Charlie. And the whole family loved Charlie. They even took Charlie on their family walks, a goldfish in the bowl, going on a family walk. One day, they came home from school and work and found Charlie belly up in his little bowl. Everyone was so sad. Uh, they so they decided to go out into the backyard and bury Charlie in his little grave. And so the family goes out there in the backyard and they're burying Charlie and they are wishing him goodbye. And on the little sign where they buried Charlie, they wrote, Charlie was fun while he was with us. I love that. Charlie was fun while he was with us. Let that be said about you. Whether you're in this region for, you know, some time or short time or whether you're on this earth for a short time or long time, you know, can it be said of us that you were fun while you were with us? I think one of our goals in life should be to bring joy to the world. And we need to cultivate that. Why? Oh, Richard, we're in the Bible that it says, I need to be full of joy. You know, Paul in Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Of course, it's the Holy Spirit that brings that joy to our lives. That we were fun while we were with them. You know, cultivate joy in your life. A close friend of mine um, sent me an email uh, about two weeks ago. And uh, for those of us in the central region, you know, I've, I've said this many times, the best is yet to come. And he sent me an email to really challenge that thought. He said, Richard, when you say that, I also want you to know that there are people who are going through all kinds of challenges and struggles. So what do you mean by the best is yet to come? I thought that was a very fair question. It really caused me to search my heart. And I thought, well, so I wrote him back. And this is what I said. Thank you for your thoughts, brother. I never knew Frank Sinatra sang that song. I never knew he sang a song called The Best is Yet to Come. I actually listened to it. It's a good song. And then it goes on to say, interesting. As far as my personal faith, I really believe it. I did not, it did not come to me as a cliche, but from my view of what it means to be in Christ. I guess we can call it a Pauline type faith. So for those of us who don't know, that's Paul, Pauline. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, a Pauline-like faith. I do remember hearing the phrase many years ago, and I thought to myself, that summarizes how I want to live my Christian life. In these times that we're in, it means even more to me. When my father died, I said to my children, boys, dad is going to suffer well. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 7. At the dinner table, we often have these conversations about our lives. And I would say, when I die and I go to heaven, and, and the boys would stop me. And said, Dad, why are you talking this way about dying and going to heaven? I said, well, because I'm a Christian. 
I have no fear of death. Philippians chapter 1, verse 22 to 26. You know, rarely do I feel that, uh, that we will not find a way out of things because God gives us wisdom from above. James chapter 1, verse 2 to 5 tells us that. Often, when I, when I look at, at hard situations, there's a part of me that just believes that somehow God will see us through. Romans chapter 4, verse 18 to 20. And as I age, with a few aches and pains, not a few, uh, it's coming, you know, I, and, and as I draw closer to Christ, I feel myself being renewed inside. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. I still desire the hill country and to finish well. Joshua chapter 14, verse 12. These days in my life, in my flesh, things seem to be more uncertain. But I'm excited to be weak because when I'm weak, I am strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 9. This is what it means to me when I say the best is yet to come. And this is what I hope to tell everyone. When they ask me, what do you mean by that? I say, that comes to me because Jesus brings so much joy to my heart. You know, I hope this message has been helpful to you. These are three things that I really believe that will make your soul so much better. Always look to the sky. Just remember, you don't have to be perfect to believe and cultivate joy in your life. Let us pray as we fix our eyes on Jesus. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that uh, we can take this moment before communion to reflect on the examples of Jesus. To remember that uh, as he looked out of the world and it was so much trouble, he looked up to the heavens and he prayed for us and he prayed for all of those who might seek him. Father, we thank you so much that uh, he demonstrates that in Peter's life, when he was at a low point, when he felt so terrible about, about his lack of faith, Jesus said, get up, Peter. My, my grace is, is sufficient for you. Let's go catch men. I love that passage, God. And then finally, just to remember the joy of Christ and that the kingdom of God is just, it's a matter of joy. And I pray for all of us that we find our joy from above, remembering that our name is written in the book of life. God, we know that this is all possible because Jesus went on that cross. And so we remember him today in our communion. God, we love you so much. We thank you for your son. It's in Hazelden that we pray. Amen.
Hello everybody, my name is Mike Cust, and I have the privilege to share with you today. Uh, so one thing that has changed in my life because of my relationship with Jesus. See, so being a disciple almost 10 years now, uh, there's been many things that have changed in many areas that I've grown in, but uh, the one thing uh, that has changed significantly is really what I found or what I find uh, valuable and important. 
Uh, so rewinding you know, 10 years ago before becoming a disciple, uh, the things that, that I found important and found my identity in were the degree I was pursuing, uh, my job, career, uh, duty title, uh, being stratified uh, as high as possible, uh, winning awards, and and these things by themselves aren't necessarily uh, bad, but the way I was pursuing them uh, was really for the wrong reasons, and, and it really just grew some, some pretty bad uh, character qualities like selfishness, greed, and uh, that also uh, affected relationships, it transpired into my marriage, and uh, just a lot of insensitivity to Megan uh, and, and her needs. And just, again, just so hyper-focused on all of these things. Um, fast forward to today and reflecting on uh, how Jesus helped me overcome these things and, and really gain confidence and contentment um, through my relationship with Jesus and what he has done uh, for me and, and all of us. So I'd like to share a scripture, Philippians 3, 14, 20 through 21. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. And for me, this, this scripture really encapsulates the change in my life and what's important. And it's not the things of this world. Again, for our citizenship rests in heaven. And by the grace of God, uh, he has forgiven me, has forgiven us, and blessed me by giving uh, me so much uh, through the resurrection, uh, through my relationship with Jesus. He has given me confidence, uh, security. Uh, I've learned to love and have compassion for others. And my self-worth and value is founded in my relationship with Jesus because of what he has done for me. I can put my confidence in him and the things above. And this has allowed me uh, to truly let go of what the world finds valuable. Thank you. Well, thank you again for worshiping with us. This video is actually shot a few days after I spoke, so a little bit of a different outfit. But um, I just wanted to say it's great if you are visiting with us that you're able to spend time worshiping with the Boston Church of Christ. I have a few announcements um, that I would like to uh, give to the Central Region. I got a call from Kelly Amaya. She brings you greetings from the Spanish ministry in the Boston Church. You'll be so proud of the brothers and sisters. Last year, uh, we saw over 30 people come to Christ, and they're working just as hard as we are to spread the gospel. However, the COVID-19 season has had a great impact. A lot of the families and friends uh, in the Spanish ministry uh, so far, we have seen over 55 people infected with the virus. And by the grace of God, we have not lost any of our church family. However, they have seen their personal family and friends die because of the pandemic. They have been really trying to take care of each other uh, because some have lost jobs and some families are in need of food and other supplies. Most recently, uh, they have reached out to us in the Central just to ask for some help uh, with some food and supplies. And that's why I got the call from Kelly. And that was easy. Uh, you know, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, that we should do first to the body of believers. So I trust that you feel the same way. We, we've got to do something to help. So this Sunday, uh, February the 7th, from 12 noon to 2 p.m., we would like to ask if you if you can drop off some food at the Arlington building. 
Uh, they're willing to take canned goods, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables because this these supplies will be delivered immediately to some of these households. So that's uh, this coming Sunday, February the 7th, from 12 noon to 2 p.m. We'll have some volunteers from our own region there to collect, to sort, to pack, and to help distribute. So thank you so much for your generosity. I know we'll step up to that need. Um, it's something that Jesus would do, especially during this time. And then finally, I just want to remind you about our midweek. Uh, this coming Thursday, February the 4th at 7.30. We look forward to seeing you online. So again, have a great week. Uh, God bless and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.